What is going on everybody and welcome back to Mets Weekly. Before we get in today's video, be sure to drop a like, subscribe. Be sure to check out the live podcast streamed at 7 o'clock Mondays, all off-season long. Be sure to follow Mets Weekly on Twitter and X for content all throughout the off-season. Be sure to follow all of my other co-hosts. Their links are in the description down below. And with all that being said, let's begin. This video is being pulled from a topic that we previous recorded video that we brought, talked about four Mets that cannot return and in today's video we're going to take one of those players being Starling Marte the last year of his four-year deal signed by Billy Epler on that big Black Friday sale obviously Starling Marte has had one good all-star season and the last few years have been dealt with injuries and regression let's also preface this that this guy is not a positive asset he is a net negative going into his 36 year old season being the final year of his deal potentially would like to move his 40 man roster spot and could open up a potential spot in the outfield where the Mets are expected to pursue many outfielders who are a massive upgrade to this team and Stanley Marte has time in New York has seen its end preface there are three trades in this package the first option is paying down a lot of the salary similar to the James McCann trade to the Baltimore Orioles number two is a trade based on taking back another bad contract that potentially fills a hole for the Mets roster and then number three is a little fun just having two teams that are in the similar boats both with big pending UFAs at certain positions and potentially trying to help each other fill those holes we'll start with the first trade and that is with the kansas city royals who are coming off a surprise playoff appearance going to the american league wild card after spending a little bit of money this past offseason and bringing in average to below average players they went out in a surprise run led by their pitching and the breakouts of bobby wood jr and obviously steady veteran presence of salvador perez but you look at their current outfield depth chart it is not the greatest you could see obviously mj melendez is playing every day in left field they also have kyle isbell playing center and then they will have this year now with the leaving free agency with current free agents tommy Pham and robbie grossman hunter renfro is back playing right with their dh position at the end of the season was obviously Vinny basquantino but you could see ab's for salvador perez as well as nelson velasquez so you look at their outfield depth chart it is not a pretty sight ronaldo blanco as well as being just strictly a base runner late in game similar to what Billy Hamilton was for the Mets you look at their window they're moving into a going from a bottom feeder to a potential maybe wild card continued team I don't expect after an offseason where they spent more money than they usually would them dipping their toes back into the free agent market for maybe guys like a Tyler O'Neill, like an Anthony Santander, maybe not even a guy like Teoscar Hernandez. There is a limit to these small market teams that they went and they spent. They also were intended to trying to get a stadium deal with that money being spent. So in that the fact that they don't have their stadium, I don't expect them to be very aggressive back in the market. So you look at the trade options and the Mets with Stalling Marte, if let's say they pay down a lot of the contract, can be a potential upgrade definitely in left field. There are some negatives to this, potentially with being Kaufman Stadium. We've seen the defensive regression of Starling Marte and putting him in the outfield that is the cavernous Kaufman Stadium is probably not a great piece to bring in and say, hey, this is an everyday out who has become one of the worst defenders, but you get into those gaps and there's, you know, that's why they were built and obviously in 2015 with guys that can get down. Where I could see him potentially getting some ABs is the DH spot if Salvador Perez is most likely against staying behind the plate. You could potentially open that up. And yes, for us, that's not. We've said that the Mets and Stalin Marte should not be the DH for us as the Mets. But the Royals being a smaller market team that they could provide. Hey, this is a guy who still had a 104 WRC+. Plus. This is an upgrade offensively, especially with Nelson Velasquez not being the greatest. So let's get into the trade idea. And that is the New York Mets would be acquiring left-handed prospect Asa Lacey and right-handed reliever Chris Stratton. The Kansas City Royals would be acquiring Starling Marte as well as $14 million. Chris Stratton just picked up his $4.5 million option, and this is a reliever who was not good this year. In over 58 and a third innings pitched, pitched to a 5.55 ERA, striking out 44 batters, and a whip over 1.4. Again, this is not a great reliever, and especially in a small market team for a reliever. For a small market team to be paying a reliever $3.5 million who coming off a bad year, 
The Mets take some of that money, $4.5 million player option that they would take. Stanley Marte would be going to the Royals of $6.75 million. So again, the Royals are only really taking on $2 million. Again, that could be talked about as an upgrade to say, hey, if they're going to take a $4.5 million reliever and turn him into an outfielder who's making the same, pretty close to what they paid Hunter Renfro. I think Hunter Renfro is making a little bit more. I think he's at 7 But again, a similar pay cut to what... Hunter Renfro got, which they were okay doing with, then you can get Stalling Marte at this, as well as they get left former top prospect at Ace Lacy, who has had massive injury problems, and when he's been on the field at 25 years old, he got up to double A in 2022, but is coming off Tommy John surgery, and the results have not been great when he has been on the field, but that has also been a major problem with Ace Lacy. He's gone through multiple surgeries. As soon as he was drafted, he got Tommy John. Now he's got his second Tommy John. So yes, you're getting a lottery ticket arm that is not going to light the world on fire, but this is going to be a realistic package for Stalling Marte is get an overpaid reliever, and then you get a lottery ticket arm. We are like, okay, maybe with this new pitching factor we've seen in the minor leagues with the Mets, that they're turning, the, you know, getting some production out of their minor minor league starters and relievers, maybe you throw Ace Lacy after he gets fully recovered, potentially in that pitching factory, and maybe you can get, you know, a, a reliever at this point. I do not think he can start, but you get a left-handed reliever that potentially you can maybe see some upside, but again, it's a really low risk with some reward if you get him into the factory, into that pitching factory down in Port St. Lucie, you get him healthy, and you get some value out of a guy like Starling Marte. Let's go to the second proposal, and that is the proposal where you take take on another bad money deal, and that is with the Cincinnati Reds. Cincinnati is coming off a disappointing year after showing some progress the year before, and they also have a very crowded infield, but their outfield not being the greatest. Their current, you know, depth chart option is Spencer Steer, who had a very solid season last year and left. TJ Friedel had a very good 2023, did not have a great 2024, and then Drake Fraley and Wright with their DH position being held currently by Jonathan India. They have a very, like I said, a very crowded infield, so they could have a piece where the Mets maybe could jump at with obviously guys like Ellie De La Cruz, Matt McClain, Jonathan India, Noel V. Marte, a lot of guys that play up the middle or third base in their internal depth chart, as well as getting, you know, Matt McClain, who missed a lot of this year back. He's currently playing in the Arizona Fall League, coming back from injury. The proposal is the New York Mets would be acquiring 31-year-old third baseman Jaimer Candelario, as well as right-handed reliever TJ Antone. The Cincinnati Reds would be acquiring Starling Marte as well as right-handed pitching prospect Robert Dominguez. John Mercandolario has $27 million owed to him guaranteed over the next two seasons. TJ Antone is on his last year of arbitration making $1.1 million. Candelario also has an $18 million club option that most likely, obviously, is going to be declined. Why does this make sense for the Mets? With Ronnie Mauricio's slow recovery coming off of a torn ACL and the ineptitude that is Brett Beatty, the Mets don't really have a third baseman currently on the roster that is healthy or productive with obviously the pending UFA that is Pete Alonso. In this world, if Pete Alonso potentially goes elsewhere, Mark Fientos would easily be shift over to first base. You don't have an everyday caliber third baseman currently on the roster. And if you look at the free agent market, I do not expect the Mets to be in that Alex Bregman conversation. And then after Alex Bregman, you get a very, if we'll see what happens with the option that is Eugenio Suarez. But after that, you go right to guys like Gio Urshela and Paul DeYoung, who are you know, fine stop gaps, but especially with them being, you know, kind of that if Suarez's option picked up, the second and third best options on the free agent market could push their contracts close to what maybe eight to ten million dollars. Geo does not have a great year. Paul DeYoung found his power stroke back with the White Sox, but then went over back to Kansas City at the trade deadline and kind of went back, but still ended up hitting over 20 home runs. So you could see both of those guys potentially getting close to maybe seven to eight million dollars on a one year deal. Jimer being a switch hitter is also a very appealing option at the bottom of the Mets lineup. I mean, you look at John Mercandolaro the last couple of years, obviously he had his bounce, his breakout with the Washington Nationals, then they pick him up on a one-year deal after trading him at the deadline to the Chicago Cubs, you know, hitting 250, hitting 22 homers, and having an 8.07 OPS, he goes out and lands this big contract with the Cincinnati Reds for three years, and then you look at this year in Great America Small Park, it wasn't a great year, but it still had over 700 OPS at 708, still found a way to pop 20 home runs. Being a switch hitter that you could potentially hit eighth in this lineup to give Ronnie Mauricio some time, but as him, similar switch hitter that you can hit, you know, eight or nine in 
the lineup that could potentially pop you 20 home runs, it's not a it's not a horrible option, especially it'd be one of the better options on the market because, again, you look at guys like Urshela and DeYoung, those aren't very appealing either. Yes, Urshela does bring in the great defense. DeYoung as well is a very capable. And then you look at a guy like TJ Antone, who's not pitched a lot recently over the last three years. He's pitched less than 40 innings over the last three years. But with David Stearns, and we've seen with the LA Dodgers, that you don't need to go out and spend big money on relievers, and can you just patch them together? TJ Antone could be a guy with high leverage upside if you can get him back on the field. And the fact that he's only going to make $1.1 million, the Reds obviously have a very good back of the bullpen with the guys like Alexis Diaz, Brent Suter, Fernando Cruz, Tony Singrani. They do have a few arms in there, so a guy that they're not going to pay next year who's going to let walk in free agency, you pair him with the bad contract that is Jammer Candelario, Marte goes back with him, and you also have the benefit of, because you're taking on the full $27 million guaranteed, you know, you don't take any money back because you're taking two years of $27 million. The Reds take that whole $20 million on of Starling Marte, and why this could fit for the Reds is... We've talked about Marte's defensive regression. In Great American Small Park, it maybe can balance out his bad because it doesn't need to have the great range in a smaller ballpark. And you'll see it with the next trade is maybe if you get Sterling Marte in a small ballpark where he doesn't have to run down as many balls, maybe you see a slight, and I mean slight, uptick in defense. But again, as he's aging, his legs are leaving. And he is an upgrade over Jake Fraley. I think it was 89 WRC plus last year. And Sterling Marte at a 104. So he is an upgrade for a corner outfield and you got look at Jake Fraley and Spen and uh, TJ Friedel who both had bad years. Spencer Steele is a really good had a really good year and potentially with moving uh, Jaimer Candelario, you can move Noel Noel Veep to first and you can get Jonathan India back at certain move McLean to third. India can go back second. You could also make him your DH. That gives the Reds a little bit of versatility with Marte if they want to use him in the outfield or that DH position, as well as moving one of those that crowded infield that they have. They move one of their guys and everyone can get settled out or potentially move Spencer Steer back to first base and you can put Stalling Marte in left. So it gives the Reds some versatility with Marte in getting rid of one of their infielders. It gives them multiple options. All right, then let's get to the last trade, which is again, the fun kind of let's try to fix a bunch of old, like I prefaced before, this is probably the most unrealistic of the three and that being the Houston Astros. They're obviously coming off a disappointing playoff appearance, getting beat by the heart and soul, the Tower of French or Detroit Tigers. They are having one year left of Kyle Tucker, who before he becomes a pending UFA. They obviously have Jordan Alvarez. They still have Alex, they still have Jose Altuve, Alex Bregman again this year as a pending UFA. So this could potentially be a team that's looking for offense. Obviously, you look at their lineup from their peak, they're they're all gone. You know, they're slowly but surely either aging out or leaving. They don't have that murderer's row like they did a few years ago when you were going one they had a terrifying one through seven. Now it's truly only, you know, Altuve, Jordan, Tucker, and then after that, we'll see what happens with Alex Bregman. Jeremy Pena has been an overall disappointment, but after that, that 6, 7, 8, 9 in that lineup is bad and does not provide you any offensive value. You look at their current outfield depth chart, Ed Chas McCormick, who had a really good Oh, uh, playoff run when they beat the Phillies in the World Series in 2022 has regressed. Uh, Jake Myers is a very good defensive center fielder, but can't hit a lick. Obviously, they have maybe the most underrated player in baseball in Kyle Tucker and Wright. And then the best DH in the American League at Jordan Alvarez. But like I said, with the Reds, the Crawford boxes could provide. Again, he's not a great defender, but you, they had Jordan Alvarez playing in left field. And we all know Jordan should not own a glove. Just let Jordan hit. Chas McCormick could potentially move back to center. Which he, he is a better offensive player than Jake Myers even though he has been a disappointment the last year. So let's say in this scenario, McCormick shifts back to center. You could put Marte in left, and now you're getting a little bit more offensive offensive side than having a guy like Jake Myers playing every day in center field. You move McCormick to center. You got Marte playing in left. Let's get into the trade, and then I will explain the others. The New York Mets would be acquiring right-handed starter Lance McCullers Jr., reacquiring reliever, right-handed reliever Penn Murphy, and they are also getting a throw-in prospect of third-base prospect Camille. Leo Diaz. The Houston Astros would be acquiring Starling Marte with $10 million attached to the deal. Third baseman Brett Beatty, as well as outfield prospect Alex Ramirez. Why would the Astros move Lance McCullers Jr.? One, he has not pitched in the last two years. He's been very injury prone as a middle of the rotation arm who has a pretty solid upside. He also carries a very big contract. The next two years, he's owed $17.7 million over each 
of the next two years. He also has, which can put a big old kibosh on this idea, he does have a full no trade clause. But let's talk about this. The Houston Astros have been acquiring a lot of pitchers. You look at their current rotation with not the pitchers that are current in, currently injured or pending UFAs. Framber Valdez, Hunter Brown, Ronaldo Blanco, Luis Garcia, and Spencer Adretti, who pitched really well for him as a cheap option. That's five starters. Then you look at their guys who were injured this year. You look at Jose Arquiti, you're looking at Christian Javier, you're looking at uh, JP France and Lance McCullers. You also would expect they would like to re-sign Yusei Kikuchi, who they gave up a haul for at the trade deadline, and Dana Brown was very adamant at the deadline that this was one of the guys that they wanted to keep. So now, you free up that Lance McCullers money, obviously pending if he's approving of his trade, no trade clause. For the Astros' sake, they ship that $17 million over the next two years, each of the next two years, to the New York Mets. You take Marte, and you know, for them, they'd free up $7 million. Camilo Diaz, just another throw-in prospect at the Mets. He's an 18-year-old, signed out of the Dominican Republic a few years ago. Penn Murphy has been a guy the Mets acquired, DFA'd, acquired again, DFA'd again. One of Stearns' first moves, I think, his first offseason. So you've seen, again, Stearns at least had interest in this player before. From the Astros' perspective, Alex Bregman is a pending UFA. So again, I maybe see a, a possibility that he comes back because of his market being very intriguing to see what his market is. Let's say Alex Bregman is leaves Houston. Brett Beatty can be an option. He's still a very good glove. He's just an atrocious bat. But let's play devil's advocate here. He's a guy that will not pull anything. You put him in a ballpark with a very short fence in left field, turn him into, let's say, a 700 OPS average hitting bat who could play a good defense at third base, add cost control for the Astros, especially they want to pay Kyle Tucker next year. So if they can, you know, turn... They're going to let Bregman walk for a Leagueman player to save some money to pay Kyle Tucker next year. And then Alex Ramirez needs to be traded this offseason. He's on the 40-man roster. He's not going to survive that. So I would expect Alex Ramirez to be traded within this offseason because he currently takes up a 40-man roster spot. You probably don't want to lose him from the Rule 5 draft for nothing. So might as well trade him anyway. And the Astros, let's say, as insurance, he is in AA. He's not performed great in AA. But again, the Astros take a flyer on him. They stick him in their system. Guy has all the upside in the world. Just hasn't been able to put it together. If, let's say, Kyle Tucker were to leave, it's maybe an option down the line for the Astros to look at. So those are my three proposals. Leave in the comment section down below. How do you see the Mets getting rid of Starling Marte? Is it a straight-up James McCann-type buy-down? Would you want them to take another bad contract from another team and swap them for it? There are some few other options out there that leave in the comment section now what those other be. Or do you expect no one to have any interest in Sterling Marte and he is going to be stuck on the Mets roster in 2025? Leave that down in the comment section down below. Thank you guys for watching, and we will see you guys next time.